Olá, meu nome é Francisco Brito Cruz, eu sou diretor do Internet Lab e a gente está aqui para fazer uma entrevista, uma conversa sobre a neutralidade da rede com a professora Bárbara Van Schellick, que é professora da Universidade de Stanford e que lá coordena o Centro de Internet Sociedade, o Center for Internet and Society. É, a nossa dinâmica aqui vai ser bem simples, a gente tem algumas perguntas para a professora Bárbara, é, depois a gente vai disponibilizar esse vídeo na, no YouTube com as legendas em português e também uma transcrição de todo o vídeo é, para que as pessoas possam citar, etc. Além disso, eu queria apresentar é, o Pedro Ramos, que é pesquisador associado aqui do Internet Lab, é, que trabalha no tema de neutralidade da rede, que junto comigo vai é, entrevistar a professora Bárbara sobre o tema da especialidade dele. Bom, é, so thank you, Professor Barbara. And, Thanks for having me. And we are starting here with uh, some questions. And so Pedro, so thank you very much, Barbara, to be here and to have this interview with us. So my first question will be: As a researcher, you saw net neutrality regulation all around the world, and what do you think are the main similarities between the public debate in different countries? And did you oversee in many other countries you studied any very particular situation that did not happen in the other countries? So it's interesting because I think you can always distinguish two parts of the network neutrality debate. One is the policy debate about what kind of rules you would want and why. And that debate in general is the same around the world. Um, and then you have the question of how to translate the rules you want into local law that is often heavily influenced by the legal situation in a certain country. In Brazil, you have the Marco Civil, and that sort of constrains what you can do in the US. We have our telecommunications law, and so that makes things different. I think the other aspect that's just interesting watching all the debates happen is differences in the level of public participation and also the way in which people rally around certain practices. There are always very different things that make people mad and then trigger the network neutrality debate. You know, in the US, we had Comcast interfering with the torrent, interfering with certain P2P file sharing applications in 2007. And so the US debate, or people in the US spend a lot of time thinking about how to regulate network management practices and how to get network providers to manage their networks in a way that doesn't harm innovation or users. By contrast, other countries that haven't had this debate as much, um, they haven't spent as much time thinking about that. So what I would note is sort of each iteration of the debate seems to focus on a different practice. So in the US last year, the thing that captured the public's attention was this idea of fast lanes that internet service providers could charge application and content providers like Google or Netflix to get better treatment. And so then those who pay get great quality and everybody who can't pay will be in the slow lane. By contrast, if you look at India and to some extent I think in Brazil, a lot of the debate has focused on zero rating. And in Europe, it's more of a mix of everything. And I don't think that's a problem in general because it's just a different point of entry to the debate. I think what's really important to realize is that network neutrality is more than just one practice and that you only get a great environment for innovation and free speech if you deal with all the practices, blocking, discrimination, and fees for preferential treatment. So, the next question is, from your perspective, uh, what lessons do you think Brazil can learn from the U.S. debate and vice versa? Yeah, so I don't as, know as much about the Brazilian debate, so I probably won't be able to say a lot about that. Uh, in terms of the U.S. debate, I think there are certain areas that are very interesting for people in Brazil and others that are not interesting at all. So at a very high level, all the policy questions we had to deal with what kind of rules do we need? Um, what kind of exceptions to network neutrality rules? They are all highly relevant to Brazil. And I think in that respect, the US model is actually a pretty good model for regulators around the world. Uh, with one exception, which is the treatment of zero rating, which I think we should talk about more later. 
Um, and I would want to add that because four and a half million people filed comments as part of that debate, there is a lot of really interesting empirical data in the comments, comments by startups, comments by artists, comments by musicians that could be valuable for regulators around the world because they help them to better understand what the implications of certain network neutrality rules might be. The part of the debate that I feel is not relevant to Brazil at all is the question of the legal foundation for network neutrality rules. You know, some people have told me that some people in Brazil look at what happened in the US and say, well, the United States treated internet service providers as telecommunications providers in order to adopt network neutrality rules. And that means we should be doing that in the US, in Brazil too. And I think that would be a huge mistake because the only reason that the US engaged in this complicated legal exercise of changing the classification of internet services was that there was a court decision that foreclosed the adoption of network neutrality rules based on other parts of the Communication Act. And so it was a legal choice for the FCC to reclassify internet service providers as telecommunication service providers, but it had nothing to do with the substance. And I would say that is something that is really only relevant for the US, but not for the Brazilian situation. Oh, <laughs> and there are actually two or three substantive points that I think are really interesting for the debate here too. So the first is that details really matter. You know, you're going through the process right now of drafting the decree for the Marco Seville, and often if you are someone who just follows the debate from a distance, you don't really see how tiny differences in, in language can really affect the outcome for consumers and innovators. And I just want to give you a tiny example, which is the rules around network management, where some people think, well, of course network providers need to manage their networks, and that's a benign motivation, so let's just allow them to do that, and that's fine. And But as we found in the US, from the perspective of the user, it doesn't make a difference why an internet service provider is interfering with your application, whether it's because they hate your content, or because you are a competitor, or because they are managing your, their network. From your perspective as the user, the end result is the same. You can't use the application you want to use. Or if you're an application provider, it means you can't get to consumers during times when everybody wants to use the internet, when it's most important to get to users. And again, in the US in 2007, when Comcast was interfering with the torrent, I heard from many startups who came into my office and said, you know, I'm not getting funding because my venture capitalist is saying, well, if nobody likes you, you are screwed and our money is lost. But if you get really successful, then you will be singled out for discriminatory bandwidth management and you'll be screwed as well. And so a lot of investors passed on funding applications that were potentially bandwidth intensive. And so that's a very long way of saying even these tiny details, like how you phrase your network management exception, have a huge impact on the quality of the regime you get. And then the other important point, I think, is the importance of bright line rules. So as lawyers, we are used to dealing with gray and ambiguous terms or complicated case-by-case -case proceedings all the time. And sometimes there is no other way. You know, certain principles can't be made more specific. So you need to apply them in a specific case. But network neutrality is different in two ways. One, the entities we are trying to protect need certainty. If I'm a startup or an investor, I need to know that my investment will be protected. And I won't get that certainty if there is a rule that says no unreasonable discrimination. Because then I will only know after someone has discriminated against me, and then I go and complain, and then three years later, and many both hundreds of thousand dollars in legal fees later, I will know whether I was protected. And at the same time for um, ISPs, internet service providers, having certainty is important too, because they want to know how they can manage their networks, and you can really stifle them as well by having ambiguous rules. 
In addition, you know, complicated case-by-case -case rules create really high costs of regulation and really tilt the playing field against everybody who doesn't have a lot of money, who doesn't have a lot of lawyers on stuff. You know, if I'm Google or Facebook or large ISPs, I have lots of money, lots of lawyers. I can afford to fight long fights in front of regulatory agencies. If I'm a user or a small nonprofit or a startup, I need to be able to complain and say, this person is, this ISP is singling out my application and that's a violation of the rule. And then the regulator looks at it and says, yeah, it is, end of story. So the importance of bright line rules and a really careful look at the details that I think two other sort of lessons that you can carry over to other parts of the world. Very interesting. So Barbara, in your research, you advocate for an application agnostic rule, uh, especially when you talk about quality of service. But in your research, in your last paper, you admitted that even an application agnostic rule must have an exception since this rule will not be in Alaska at all. But how do you see how this uh, how these exceptions might be framed in the regulation? Yeah, so let me take a step back for a moment and just explain That's what the non-discrimination rule should be. So the first step is to when you when you think about non-discrimination rules, you have a whole range of options. You can say any discrimination is bad, so basically you have to treat every packet the same or every discrimination is okay, and then everything in between. And the non-discrimination rule I su I'm suggesting, and that's the rule that the FCC adopted in the end, um, is one that says you cannot engage in what we call application-specific discrimination, and I'll explain what that is in a second, but you are allowed to engage in discrimination that is application agnostic. So the general idea is to recreate the environment that we had when the internet was first built, where an internet service provider could not look into the packets to see what was going on on the network, and as a result, it couldn't do anything about that. And so now we are trying to recreate this environment through law by saying, even if you know what kind of applications users are using, you cannot act on that information when you manage your network or price services. So that means any criterion that's related to the application is prohibited. It could be what kind of application you are using. So is it Skype, but not other internet telephony applications? That's what we call discrimination against a single application within a class of similar applications. So discrimination against applications. And then discrimination against classes of applications is everything else where you group certain applications together based on something that's specific to them. Could be their technical characteristics, like these are delay sensitive applications, what type of application they are, what protocols they are using, so everything you can imagine. That's very important, so it's not a rule that says you can discriminate against different kinds of applications if they are not similar or have different requirements. And we can talk more about that later if you want to. What you can do is discriminate based on um, information that has nothing to do with the application people are using, how much they have paid, how much data they are using, at what time they are using the network. And the really interesting feature of that kind of rule is that it strikes the perfect balance between the interests of the network providers in managing their networks and being able to offer new innovative services and the interests of users and entrepreneurs and sort of society in having an open platform for innovation, economic activity and speech and whatever we do online. And sort of the reason this is perfect is because you can actually solve most problems in application agnostic ways. So I'll give you an example from pricing. If you want to charge different prices, an application agnostic way of doing that is one we all know, so that if you get more bandwidth, you need to pay more. But another one would be that's application agnostic. I have special prices for students or special prices for old people. But then we do not make distinctions based on what kind of applications they are using. 
By contrast, there are some pricing schemes that you see in Europe and in some Latin American countries where you actually pay a different price for the packets that transport internet telephony over packets that transport other stuff. That distorts users' choices on the internet because it makes certain applications more expensive than others. Technically, it protects applications against distortion of competition by ISPs. And you know that's easy to see when we talk about an application provider giving an advantage to their own online video application or even singling out a specific application for special treatment. But even with classes of applications, you know, often an ISP can hurt applications when they harm all online video providers or all text messaging applications or all online telephony applications. So just because it's a whole group, it doesn't mean you are safe. So you were asking about exceptions. You actually get very far without exceptions because application agnostic discrimination is immediately allowed. But then you do need exceptions for network management practices. And so the FCC adopted a net reasonable network management exception that if effectively says you need to have a legitimate network management purpose the practice needs to be appropriate and tailored. That means only during times of congestion. You can't just throttle the network all the time. You need to wait for congestion. And it needs to be as application agnostic as possible. The as possible is really important because there are, while many network management problems can be solved in an application agnostic way, congestion management is a great example. Some can't. If I have an application that's engaged in a denial of service attack on my network, I can say, hey, you need to just shut down all applications. No, of course, you need to shut down that application. And so the as possible as your safety valve. Or on a mobile network, you know, in general, they can manage congestion in application agnostic ways too. So, you know, they allocate bandwidth among users, but they don't do it based on what application you are using. But there might be emergency situations or sort of a big football game where there is just far too much cell phone traffic where as sort of you might have to fall back on a somewhat more intrusive form of network management where you might make distinctions among classes of applications. And you know, it might sound sort of quite complicated when you hear me talk about it this way, but this rule has been in effect in the US basically since 2008 for network management and the non-discrimination rule since 2010. And in Canada, we have had this reasonable network management exception since 2009, 2010. And so all the US and Canadian providers have been managing their networks in this way and it has worked very effectively. You know, you asked about quality of service. So that is, an interesting question because you know quality of service is the ability to offer different types of services as part of the normal internet service you know the internet we use today only offers a single service best effort service you know the internet does its best to deliver the packets but it doesn't make distinctions um, uh, it doesn't um, provide any guarantees about when the packets will arrive or whether they arrive at all and Sometimes you meet people say, oh, but that's a problem because applications actually have different needs. Email is not sensitive to delay, but reacts very, um, doesn't tolerate packet loss very well. By contrast, online telephony is quite sensitive to delay, but can tolerate a few packets that are lost here and there. So these people might say, well, if I give a low delay service to online telephony, I'm not really hurting email. And, or they say there might be applications that might never exist if we are unable to offer quality of service on the internet. And on the other hand, a lot of people think, wow, but that would be really dangerous because it would allow ISPs to use the provision of quality of service as a tool to distort competition. And I'll give you an easy example where when I talk about quality of service, often internet service providers come to me and say, 
can I give low delay service only to online gaming, but not to internet telephony? Both are sensitive to delay, but the ISPs would like to profit from the added value that users get when online gaming works better, but they don't really want to make online telephony more competitive with their traditional telephony services. So we are worried that ISPs might use the provision of quality of service as a tool to distort competition. And at the same time that once you offer better services and allow people to pay for them, you always get an incentive for the ISP to downgrade the quality of the baseline service. You know, we know this from flying, business economy class needs to be sufficiently unattractive to motivate people to pay to be in business class. And so we are also worried about the collateral damage for those who don't get the great service. So for this reason, there is discrimination involved and there are potential problems. A lot of people have said network neutrality should just prohibit quality of service. And they often also say, well, we don't really know whether we need quality of service because all the application that people always claim wouldn't work without quality of service work really well in the open internet. You know, for years people said, you will never be able to do online telephony without a low delay service. Online video won't work without low delay. And they all work great. So I think this is too black and white. And what many people don't realize is that there are different ways in which you can offer quality of service. And I have looked at them in detail and it turns out they have very different costs and benefits. And so there is one way of offering quality of service that does not create problems from a network neutrality perspective. And that's the one I think uh, regulators should allow under a network neutrality routine. It has three conditions. We call it user-controlled, user-paid quality of service. So the internet service providers can make different services available, but it cannot determine or control how it can be used. So an internet service provider might offer the normal best effort service, but in addition, a low delay service and maybe a guaranteed bandwidth service and maybe a less than best effort service but it, can't, it just makes these services available. It can't say you can only lose, use my low delay service for online gaming. So we take them out of the picture. Second condition, only the users choose whether and when to use which service. So I might use the low delay service for online gaming, you might use it for online telephony, you might use it to upload a file on the deadline. That's the second. And the third is only the users are allowed to pay for it. The application providers can't pay. That creates all the problems with charging for fast links. This doesn't create any real problems because the internet service providers have no ability to discord competition because they have no say in who gets which quality of service. Users get exactly the kind of quality of service they need because they are the ones that make this choice. So if I'm just chatting with a friend, I might not want low delay service for online telephony. But if I'm doing a job interview, I might be really happy to be able to opt into the low delay service. And then it's also better for innovators because if I come up with a new application, I don't really want to go around the world and convince ISPs that I need this kind of service. They have no interest in dealing with scrappy upstarts from around the world. But I, as the user who wants to use this application, have all the interest in the world to make it work. So if I come up with a new application, I just tell my users it would be better if you use low delay service and then you can do that. So that model doesn't create any problems for innovation or user choice, but at the same time allows the network to evolve. I said you don't really need an exception to my rule for that because user choice is actually an application agnostic criteria. So just making different services available, that is not discriminating between classes of applications. And then the criterion is the user said, I want this service, and that has nothing to do with the application that I'm using. So you don't even need an exception. And so it might be interesting to know that in 2010, the FCC is explicitly clarified 
that its non-discrimination rule and reasonable network management exception would allow exactly this kind of quality of service. And the group of European regulators, Barrick, in a report also adopted this idea and said, you know, that would be a way, a very good way to offer quality of service that's in line with network neutrality. And, you know, if anybody wants to read more about that, I've written a paper that's called Network Neutrality and Quality of Service that's available online and that explains all of this in a lot more detail. So, the next question is, what's your opinion about zero reading? So, do you oversee any relation between this subject and the concept of development? Yeah, so zero rating, as we all know, is the practice of exempting certain applications from your monthly bandwidth caps. And people start wondering whether zero rating is a network neutrality problem because, at least at first sight, it doesn't involve any technical discrimination among packets. It looks like an economic discrimination. You know, the packets all get to the user in the same way, but some count against your cap and some don't. So some people have questioned whether that's a network neutrality problem. I think the first thing to realize is that zero rating has a really strong discriminatory effect. So even though the packets are treated in the same way, users react really strongly to zero rating. And one of our key concerns in network neutrality and anti-discrimination rules is that we are worried that the ISP will make some applications more attractive than others. Well, zero rating is the perfect tool to do that. Because in surveys, users make very clear that if content is zero rated, they prefer it. And Slate, the online magazine in the US, did an experiment where they offered the same podcast to some users in a zero rated form and to others in a way that just counted against the cap. Users that were offered the zero-rated version were 61% more likely to click on the podcast. So you have a huge impact on people's behavior. Once you have recognized that, you need to come to the conclusion that it really doesn't make any difference whether people discriminate or make certain applications more attractive by slowing them down or speeding them up or by exempting them from the cap. It's the same effect, just a different tool. So my view is that zero rating, the different kinds of zero rating should be treated in exactly the same way as technical forms of discrimination. So if we have, we, if we want, if we ban ISPs from charging content providers to be in the fast lane, we also have to ban ISPs from charging application and content providers to be zero rated. You, the key problem with charging for better treatment is that if some companies can pay so that their content loads faster or doesn't count against users' bandwidth cap, then those who can't pay don't have a chance to compete. And we know from the US proceeding that startups don't, are unable to pay to in, be in the fast lane, so they won't be able to be zero rated either. Or a lot of speakers, civil society organizations, churches, educational institutions, independent artists, they don't have money to pay to be zero rated. You know, large corporations do. And so you get exactly the same distortion that you create an environment where only those who can pay have an easy way of reaching people. At the same time, you get the same problems about downgrading the quality of service. You know, in paying for fast lanes, we are worried that the ISP will downgrade the quality of the technical transmission service. In zero rating, we have a lot of evidence from Europe that ISPs have an incentive to reduce bandwidth caps to make it more attractive to pay to be zero rated. So in those countries where ISPs do engage in zero rating, bandwidth caps decrease and unrestricted bandwidth becomes more expensive. So users are hurt in, and application providers who can't pay are hurt in two ways. They have less bandwidth available that they can use however they choose. And as an application provider, if I can't pay, I have an even harder time to getting to people because they don't really have a choice. At the same time, we have evidence from the Netherlands that if uh, the regulator bans zero rating, the ISPs increase the bandwidth caps. So 
um, the Dutch provider doubled its bandwidth caps at the same price from five to 10 gigabytes after zero rating was prohibited because you know, they wanted people to be able to use their own online video application and given that they couldn't zero rate, the only other choice was to give enough unrestricted bandwidth to everybody. And that uh, helps everybody because then we can use not just the providers online video but others too. So same with just singling out specific applications for zero rating without fees has the same distortionary effect should be banned as well. Now your question about sort of how is this related to development? And you know, we sometimes hear that, oh, this shouldn't apply in development with developing countries because zero rating might be a really great way of giving underserved community underserved communities access to at least a slice of the internet. And so people who support this idea say, well, if I'm poor, it's better for me to get access to a part of the internet for free rather than not have internet at all. And so they say, if you, zero, if you forbid ISPs from just making certain applications available to everybody on a zero-rated basis, like free basics from Facebook or these Facebook zero plans that were existing, you are hurting users and particularly those poor users who can't really afford internet access. I think that is an absolutely false choice because the alternative is not between giving users access to a subset of applications that are zero-rated on not giving them access to applications at all. And here's why. So in many of the zero rating plans, the application provider doesn't actually pay to be zero rated. So if you look at free basics, Facebook doesn't pay the ISPs to be zero rated. So the person or the entity that pays for the bandwidth is the ISP. How do they do that? They make certain calculations. They look at how much people, people use on average for the zero rated applications. And they roll that into the price of your cellular subscription because you usually pay for the telephone subscription. So that means instead of using this investment to pay for the bandwidth you use for the zero rated applications, let's say free basics, they could give you the same amount of bandwidth put a cap on that and allow you to use it in an unrestricted way. Um, I think that's a much better alternative. It has exactly the same costs for the ISP. You know, they pay for the bandwidth anyways. They cap at the point where they would have otherwise kept off the, the, um, the service. But it's a lot better for users and everybody else because now users can decide how they want to use this bandwidth and everybody can offer their applications to users. So in that sense, the idea is that just because it's a developed country, you should be all over zero rating, I think is a myth. Um, if you're interested in this model, I think Mozilla has been experimenting with it. They call it equal rating. And I think in some countries, they have offered this kind of model where the ISP gives users a certain amount of data, I think it's 500 megabytes per month, and they can use it in whatever they, way they want. There are actually two other aspects of zero rating and development that people don't necessarily think of. And I actually think zero rating is often particularly harmful for speakers and startups in developing countries. So if we look at zero rating against a fee, there, you know, local startups or local speakers often won't be able to pay to be zero rated. Large international corporations will have no issues paying. So through this complicated mix of once you allow zero rating, bandwidth caps decrease, it gets a lot harder for local applications, local speakers to get their content and their applications out into the world. And even in those cases where the content provider does not pay money to be zero rated, if you look at the applications that are being zero rated, in those cases, without the payment of the fee, it's either the ISP zero rates their own application, online video or cloud storage, that kind of thing, or they pick the top category, the top applications in a category. So they might 
say we zero rate the top three social networking applications. And then if you look at them, surprise, it's Facebook and you know large international corporations. So you might say they are effectively paying with their brand, but what this does is it's just another way of cementing the dominant position of these applications. And again, it makes it a lot harder for a new entrant to be successful. Imagine if Facebook is zero rated and you are a Brazilian social network and you are not zero rated. You know, even if there is no payment involved, users would have a really hard time choosing the non-zero rated application. So I actually think zero rating and development tilts in the other direction where zero rating is really harmful for local content and applications. So, uh, the, the open internet rules address inter interconnection issues, a topic that was addressed in Brazilian regulation more than 10 years before Marcos Zero. Why do you think interconnection was not a big issue in the US until the Netflix versus Comcast deal? That's actually a really interesting question. So I think there are a number of reasons for that. So first, when we first started to think about network neutrality, we focused on what's happening on the end user's access network because that was the most obvious choice. You know, deep packet inspection technology had become available. ISPs were involved in blocking. Um, the head of SPC said, I want to charge Google and Facebook and all the applications for access to my users. So that drove the debate. By contrast, most ISPs were small and as a result were buying transit to the internet. So there was never a problem of ISPs charging anybody to get access to their users because the ISPs were paying to get access to the internet. So it just wasn't a problem. So then a couple of things happened. First, we actually got sort of First, we had informal network neutrality rules, then sort of a mix of formal and informal regulations. So even before 2010, we actually had real network neutrality rules in the US, but sort of formally only since 2010. And they only apply to what happened on the access network. So all of this made ISPs very hesitant to mess, like block or discriminate on the network because they didn't want to attract regulatory scrutiny. So they realized, it's actually a really interesting way around the rules. In the same way that you can block traffic while it travels over the network, you can block it when it enters the network at the point of interconnection. Or in the same way in which you could charge application or content providers for access to your users, which was explicitly prohibited under the open internet rules, you could charge ISP, uh, the content providers or the interconnecting networks for interconnection. So given that the opportunities to engage in dangerous practices on the access network was foreclosed, so the pressure to do stuff shifted to the point of interconnection. At the same time, the market structure changed. Comcast, for example, became a major backbone provider. There was a lot of consolidation among ISPs, and suddenly, there were large ISPs who controlled access to a significant chunk of the population. So when you look at what happened in the interconnection debate, in interconnection in the US, it wasn't actually just Netflix. So for those of you who haven't really followed the debate, so if people in the US started to notice when Netflix became effectively unusable. And it turned out that the reason was that not just Comcast, the major five to six major providers in the US were not upgrading the capacity at the point of interconnection. And as a result, the quality deteriorated, even though there was enough capacity everywhere. And they were saying to Netflix, if you pay, we'll upgrade the capacity, but if you don't, we won't upgrade. And so in the end, Netflix paid and suddenly capacity increased again. But it wasn't just a Netflix problem. So if there have been very detailed studies done by Measurement Lab and the Open Technology Institute at the New America Foundation has a very interesting report that sort of looks at all the data. And they show there was at that is sort of 56 or 65 million users in the US 
were affected by these measures. And by now, so if we were in a situation where you cannot get good quality interconnection unless you pay. So it's basically the flip side of this idea of if you are allowed to charge, you have an incentive to downgrade the quality of the baseline service. We see this in effect in interconnection. You know, and it harms users, it creates lots of problems, the internet is full of complaints of people who couldn't telecommute, couldn't access their patient records, long distance learners, so huge problems and it harms users, but ISPs don't react because they want to motivate those who can pay to pay for interconnection. So all of these reasons led the FCC to ultimately determine as part of the open internet proceeding that any network neutrality rule will be incomplete if you regulate what's happening on the network but leave the point of interconnection free from any regulation. They were more hesitant to come up with detailed rules for that part of the rules because they said, we haven't really had as much time to think about what's happening in that space. So they just adopted the rules that says interconnection practices need to be just and reasonable. And you can bring complaints and we can figure out what needs to be done then. I personally think there is a need for more substantive rules, but this is a very important first step. I just want to add that this has been a problem for a longer time. Even in 2010, there were problems in this space, but they happened right before the 2010 rules were adopted. And so at the time, the FCC said, let's just separate the two, look at them separately, and then they never got around to interconnection. So even though the public only really learned about this now, um, it has actually been a problem for quite a while. So Barbara, last question. Uh, apart from zero rated and interconnection, what do you think it will be the next hot topic on the debate of net neutrality? Do you oversee any subject that might be a great discussion in the next few years? Yeah, so I mean, clearly, just to reiterate, because you're still at this stage of the proceeding, I think getting things like the non-discrimination rule right, getting the reasonable network management exception right, is incredibly important because you will be stuck with a bad system of rules if you don't get these rules right. But I take your question sort of to be broader than that. So we talked about zero rating. I think the two things that are on the table are the quality of service question, if it's not explicitly dealt with in the rules or sort of indicated in the same way that I said, okay, this kind of quality of service would be okay under the rules. I think it's probably interconnection and specialized services. So we talked about interconnection and you know, in Brazil you have some rules governing interconnection, but as far as I know, these rules do not regulate this question of charging for access to users at the point of interconnection. So even though I haven't looked into what's happening in Brazil, I wouldn't be surprised if you have the exact same problem that you are either already in a world or moving to a world where you need to pay to get good quality interconnection. And so if looking into that space and sort of getting data, figuring out what the right policy choice is, that's going to be important. I think the other big issue that is really hard is this question of specialized services or what the FCC's rules now call non-broadband internet access service, non-biased service. Mm -hmm. So the general idea here is that the network infrastructure is used for different technologies that all use IP technology and not all of them are the public internet. So we have internet access over the public internet, but then we might have cable providers that offer telephony services. As a user, I will have no idea how these services are provided, but technically in the network, the network actually uses IP technology to send the voice packets back and forth. Or in the US, if you get television from AT&T, the, te the telephone company, that is IP technology. It's sort of managed separately from the internet, but sort of under the hood, it's the same technology as internet access. So 
Now the question is, should these services be subject to the open internet rules as well? I don't think that's the right choice. And part of what makes this tricky is that depending on how you structure your network neutrality regime, there might be things you can't do on the open internet. I mean, in a regime like the US regime, where you can engage in user-controlled, user-paid quality of service, the range of services that really can't be provided over the open internet is a lot smaller than if you live in a country that has said no quality of service at all. Then there might be services that might really need specific quality of service to exist, and then you would want ISPs to be able to enable that. You know, examples that are sometimes mentioned but are not necessarily really applicable are things like telemedicine operations. In the US, that is not really a specialized service because the open internet rules only apply to the consumer-facing internet. So if I'm a surgeon and I do remote surgery, I'm not doing that from my home over my public internet connection. I'm doing that from the hospital which has private deals with the ISP and that's just separate, so you don't even need an exception from specialized services. In Europe, where um, the open internet rules just apply to all internet access services, it might become more relevant for something like remote surgery, where you really want to make sure that the critical packets don't get lost. So that's a very long way of saying, one, specialized services should exist, but there is this space or the need for it is smaller depending on how much you allow under your network neutrality rules. The second big issue is how to make sure that the provision of specialized services can be used to do an end run around your network neutrality rules. I give you an example. So in the US, we ban fees to be in the fast lane. So on the open internet, an ISP couldn't go to Netflix and say, you pay me and I give you guaranteed bandwidth and low delay. That would be illegal. So now we don't want the ISP to turn around and say, hey, Netflix, you give me money, I give you low delay service, guaranteed bandwidth, and we just call it specialized service. So we have an explicit rule in the open internet rules that says you cannot use specialized services to circumvent the open internet rules or to offers something as a specialized service that basically is a replacement for internet service. Second important safeguard, because these services all share the same pipe into the home, there is a real concern that over time ISPs will say, hey, specialized services are so attractive, we can make so much money, so all the additional capacity that we get over time we'll put towards specialized services and over time, there is less and less bandwidth, relatively speaking, available for internet service. Or sometimes specialized services are structured in the way that they take bandwidth away from your internet access. If you subscribe to AT&T Uverse and several people watch television in your home, they take that away from your internet service. And so you have a lot less bandwidth for that. So second big problem, there always needs to be a rule that says, you know, specialized services can't be offered to the detriment of the general internet, and you need to make sure that you invest in both equally. Then there is a problem around sort of if you offer specialized services, that again would give you the opportunity to play games, pick winners and losers. So at a minimum, there should be rules that say, if you offer specialized services, they need to be offered in a non-discriminatory way. So if you offer it to Netflix, you also need to offer it to any other online video providers at similar terms and conditions to make sure that they, even to the extent there are specialized services, um, we preserve innovation and competition there. Um, how exactly to best do this is still very much an open question. You know, the FCC took the approach, we don't define specialized services, we say they exist and we adopt these safeguards. They say very clearly that the facilities-based online telephony applications like K2 
cable, voice, and um, tele uh, television over telecommunications network and voice over LTE, so the mobile voice offering that's offered by the provider, those are specialized service services and they can continue to be offered. But apart from that, they just say, here are all the procedural safeguards and we will look at that. The European Union is trying a different approach where they actually try to put a lot of the safeguards into the definition of specialized service, where they try to define specialized services so narrowly that it makes it impossible to use that to circumvent the rules. The European Parliament in April 2014 adopted a proposal that was actually quite strong in that respect. It said, you know, it's only a specialized service it if it requires quality of service from end to end, not just over the access network. It needs to be managed on separate capacity, which helps a little bit with taking bandwidth away from each other. And there was another condition that I can't recall right now. The problem is this, these strong rules were totally watered down in the negotiations between the Council and the Parliament and the Commission. And right now it's a big question what kind of specialized services definition they adopt. And if it's the wrong definition, then you can just use specialized services to circumvent that. But I think so. I think interconnection and specialized services are some of the next big things that will come up as new technologies evolve. So, uh, thank you, Professor Barbara. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Obrigado uh, a todo mundo, obrigado, Pedro, e todas as transcrições e materiais relativos a essa entrevista a gente vai disponibilizar no nosso site, que é o www.internetlab.org.br. Obrigado.